Humor can go places, say things that are otherwise often beyond words. Author and playwright Drew Hayden Taylor does just that in his most recent collection of essays, the best of funny, you don't look like one, as he explores the contours of being mixed race, of interracial relationships, and the complexity of feeling caught between two worlds. Drew Hayden Taylor joins us now, welcome. Buenos dias, como esta? <laughs> we're already laughing <laughs> off, uh, so it's going to be a very interesting interview. Um, we're going to spend the next half hour talking about the book, but um, mm. why did you feel at this point in your career to release a collection of your essays? Uh, well, this this book is a collection of four earlier volumes of essays, funny you don't look like one through four. Mm -hmm. And I, I wrote these at a time when... Um, the exploration of various native topics and various native issues was was uh, coming to the forefront, and one of them being the concept of identity. And having grown up on the reserve, looking the way I do, then coming into the city, mm -hmm. where the dominant population had a, has a perception of what native people look and act like, and the fact that I didn't belong, uh, I didn't fit into that perception, um, it allowed me the unique opportunity back then in the 90s and uh, early 2000s to write about identity and the perception of Native people, pop culture, all these different things. And it was a really bizarre experience. The very first one I really, really tackled was called uh, Pretty Like a White Boy because a whole series of issues, uh, Oka had just happened and um, people were talking about Native people but oftentimes not in the most positive way and in the most humorous way. So I just went home one night after an encounter with a taxi driver. I sat at my computer and I did something I very rarely do. I never write at night because my mind gets going and going and going and it gets tough for me to sleep, but I had all these things in my head. I sat down, I just, if you'll pardon the expression, vomited out 54 lines of annoyance, anger, observation into one page, I remember on my computer at that time, one page was 54 lines. And I went, started dot, 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 rant, ended rant, dot, 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 no structure, whatever, went to bed, got up the next morning, read it over and thought, there's actually something here. Has no structure, needs to be put together and, and filled in. And um, I ended up uh, spending about a, a week working on it and it ended up being uh, pretty like a white boy, which is one of the things I most, known for 20 years later. It's, that, it's been anthologized to death, it's taught in, in the high schools and universities because it's an exploration of identity, right? My, you know, my standard joke being, I'm half Ojibwe, half Caucasian, so technically that makes me an occasion. Or as I like to say, special occasion, if not a memorable occasion. We're gonna talk about that essay in a little bit because I also can identify, as you can tell. Um, but during the time that you started writing the essays and now, how much has changed or how little has changed between Canada and Indigenous people, I the relationship? I think there's much more of a broader acceptance of the, the um, many different facets of the Native community. I remember back then in the 90s, they were doing a production of um, I think it was Ecstasy of Rita Joe at York University. Mm -hmm. And I remember I went up to give a lecture and a lot of the actors up there, some of them native actors, were commenting that the director all wanted them to dye their hair black. And I just remember being very, very surprised and I sort of walked in and the director was in my lecture and I started talking about the, 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 the multifaceted dimension of, of the Aboriginal community. And I think I was told afterwards that he sort of dropped that request. So there has been progress on one level, but there is still this annoying little bit of, I'll say it, ignorance on, on, um, on a, a number of different aspects of Native culture. So with something like this, where I approach um, politically volatile topics in a humorous and, um, in some cases, tongue-in-cheek way, I think it sort of helps build that bridge between issues that are important to us and that issues that the dominant culture should be familiar with. What do you think is the biggest misconception that people have about Indigenous culture? Oh, there's culture? a whole bunch of them. One is the fact that, it's, it's interesting, it's a, it's a, it's a contradictory, mm -hmm perception. One is that there's so much government money being pumped into Native communities all the time, that we're all rich, we're all wealthy, we don't pay income tax, all these different things. Yet, on the other hand, there's this other perception that we're all poverty-stricken and, um, you know, uh, living um, tragic existences. And both are incredibly incorrect. I live on my reserve, I pay income tax. 
a vast majority of uh, Native people in today's society, both on and off the reserve, pay income tax. Um, and there are like, th what is there, 330 Native communities across Canada, uh, an odd number like that. And I get asked about this, and I always talk about, you take 330 random uh, small towns all across Canada, just pick them out, and you'll, you'll run the spectrum from poverty-stricken to um, middle class and well-off, and it's the same with Native communities. My reserve is fairly middle class. Some reserves are poverty-stricken. And so it's sort of educating the public that there's, a, again, that broad spectrum. And who should educate? Do you think it's the media? Like, you know, well, what everybody, is everybody is responsible for education. Mm -hmm. I do buy it through writing. Media does, it bit, does its bit. Um, you know, people on the street telling stories or, or, or talking about Native people should do their bit. Education is a responsibility of everybody, not, not just a, uh, a handful. And during, uh, looking back in the book, are there any topics that you've had like a complete 180 on that you think you approach differently? Uh, ooh, that's, a, that's, that's really interesting. I've never thought about that. Um, I think there's more interesting topics that have come up that need to be explored. Whether I've done a 180 on some of them, I'm not sure. Um, there are, there's, there's complicated stuff that I, 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 I have a trouble dealing with, that I don't know what my perspective is. I envy people who, who, who um, know where they stand immediately. Like a good, a good example is what's happening, I think, in, in uh, I think it's um, Ganawagi, where um, they're... Uh, going through the process of kicking non-native people off the reserve who have married um, native people and they're saying it's all right to do this and kick them off all that sort of thing and it's become a divisive issue and, and i can see both sides and i am sitting there going i can see both sides i want to be all welcoming because there's there's there, um, a lot of my relatives have married non-native people and they've been welcomed into the community um, but also I can see the community um, wanting to sort of maintain their culture, their standard. So it's, it, there, are, there are topics that are very, very difficult to sort of, for me to say this is right, this is wrong. And as we get, uh, you know, time progresses, new issues are starting to um, uh, assert themselves. Right now, one of the interesting things that's come up is the concept of, have you, have you ever heard of the term skirt shaming? No. In a lot of traditional ceremonies, especially for women, there's a there's a, um, uh, a way you should dress. You should wear long skirts, uh, ankle length, um, and have a just a you know it's a protocols. And in some situations, uh, some women show up in shorts, in jeans, whatever. And some of the elders have, as, it, as the title suggests, skirts shaming them, have chastised them for dressing inappropriately, have not allowed them to participate, have excluded them, have publicly embarrassed them in that particular situation because they're not wearing the proper attire. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's an article I'm working on right now. That would be very interesting to read. Um, so I want to talk about uh, your essay that we were talking about before, and I want to read an excerpt uh, okay. from it. And you write... Yes, I'm afraid it's true. The author happens to be a card-carrying Indian. Once you get past the aforementioned eyes, their fair skin, the light brown hair, and noticeable lack of cheekbones, there lies the heart and spirit of an Ojibwe storyteller, honest Indian, or as the more politically term may be, honest Aboriginal. Um, how many times in your life would you say you've been told that you don't look Aboriginal? Oh my God, uh, uh, I just can't get into it. Even, yeah. even amongst Native people. <laughs> I was at, a, I was at a, off, uh, a writing workshop in Winnipeg, and there were three Native authors there. There was me, the playwright, there was a, um, a local poet, and a television writer. And we all got up and we did our, our lectures, and then we all went to three tables, and we rotate, rotated where we did specific discussions of our work, and then opened up for questions. And I remember I was at this one table, and I was talking, and there was this, this, this couple at the end of the table, a native couple, and they were sitting side by side and they were whispering to each other and we kept, I kept talking, then I opened it up for a question and the man put his hand up and said, uh, sorry, uh, I have a, uh, my question is, you said you were native, and I went, yes, and that you live on a reserve, and I went, yes, and that you have a status card, yes. <laughs> Can I see it? 
<laughs> okay, so I took out my stack card, I passed it to him. He and his uh, partner are looking at it and they've handed it back and they said, you know, we were trying to figure this out. We thought maybe it was one of these reverse adoption things where you're some white person <laughs> adopted by a native family or something. By Angelina Jolie. <laughs> <laughs> or Madonna. Oh, Madonna. Um, I, okay, as a person who's mixed race, uh, when I go back home, everyone's always telling me what I'm not. They yeah. say I'm Jamaican, they say I'm Muzungu. Muzungu is like, the N-word, but it means white. And the way they say it, it's like, they obviously know that you're, you're not white. In Ojibwe, it's shuganash, oh, means white people. Yeah, so they, they'll they say everything that I am not, and they tell me, and if I say I'm African, I'm Ugandan, they're like, no, you're not. Do you ever get insulted by that? Uh, no, not anymore. Like, I've reached a certain point in my career where most people know me, know mm -hmm. my work, and know that I specifically deal in Native issues. Mm -hmm. um, occasionally, when somebody's angry with me or upset or whatever, they often say, you're not Native, you're not Native. But it's like, you know, as I said, I live on the reserve. I live in my mother's house. I, I, um, I grew up eating eating bologna and hangover soup. I just like it's. Well, I refer to the term. I don't know if you came across this in the book. Um, uh, AAA, Ab <laughs> Aboriginal Ancestry Assessors, <laughs> and it's like what kind of credential, what kind of undergraduate they work be you need? Your blood, how pure is the blood? <laughs> I know. I, read, I keep reading about that, and that would scare me. Um, does um. Because I know I've been in situations where people will say things, like derogatory things about Africans. And then I'll say, wait a minute, I'm African. They're like, oh, you don't look it. Have you ever found yourself in situations oh, like, uh, kind of like a cloaking device where people... Well, I often say I could be a great undercover agent for the <laughs> AFN or whatever. Yeah, well, people just have to think beyond, like, look beyond the color, right? Well, I always tell people, every other cell is native. <laughs> Because you're half and half. <laughs> um, I want to treat this. But some of my best friends are white. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> They're kind, gentle people with interesting literature, some excellent cuisine, and have been maligned far too long. <laughs> I wanted to read this excerpt because uh, I found it really interesting. Um, and you write, while it is true being born native in this country is a political act in itself, that's about the extent of it for me. What do you mean by that? Well, <clears throat> Being born native in Canada, whether you're, you're, you look or, or like me or not, oftentimes what you do, everything you do is a political statement in itself. What you eat, where you live, who you date, is, are all political statements. And at some point, I have to like step away from that going, sometimes, you know, I want an English muffin. It has nothing, nothing to do with a political statement or whatever. It is what it is. Um, and... At, at some, you know, I wear, I have, um, I have, I have two Indian motorcycle T-shirts, and I wrote a novel about an Indian motorcycle. And people comment on, you know, that you realize that's cultural appropriation and making money off our name, and it's even not even. Uh, I, I, I've gone through the whole thing, and I, I say, well, look at it this way. I'm wearing it ironically, right? You know, I, now look at. I tell them, deconstruct what irony is, and deconstruct what I'm doing, and you'll see the. Uh, what I'm doing, and it's so funny, and so many people can't actually deconstruct the word irony. So, uh, so yes, there's a lot of stuff there. Being born native in this country is a political statement in itself, so I often say, I'm political by birth, not by choice. So, and what I do, where I go, what I say sometimes has political ramifications mm -hmm. when it's not intended, but, you know, being, uh, being native in this country is full of choices, it's full of decisions, and full of um, perceptions. Well, I want to read another excerpt from the if book. If you must. <laughs> uh, if I must. <laughs> well, this is a, uh, okay. While attending an Aboriginal academic conference, I happened to be part of an informal gathering where a friend of mine, in conversation with several other scholarly Aboriginals, expressed her confusion over white peoples, or those we call the color challenged, Pig, hard, also pigment denied. <laughs> die hard refusal to accept guilt or culpability for what has been what has happened in the 506 years of colonialism. Basically, but severely paraphrased, she said, "When are white people going to accept their guilt for what their ancestors have done? I don't think they seriously understand their responsibility." Somewhere deep inside me, I could feel DNA picking sides. <laughs> now, that last line, it sounds like it's tongue-in-cheek, but is there a part of you that feels like you have to oh, pick a side? Constantly. The thing with me is, um, like, I grew up with my, mother on, uh, my mother's family on the reserve. Mm -hmm. I never knew my father. So I was raised culturally Ojibwe, Anishinaabe. I have no connection to my white half. So other than other than the physical ramifications of the body sitting in front of you, so yes, I sometimes wonder about that. But my um, 
my my allegiance, my knowledge, every like I write completely indigenous stories because that is the knowledge I do. And uh, and while sometimes I sit there, as I said, I often see both sides of, of these issues, mm -hmm. but. Um, I am who I am, but I did actually explore this topic in a in a, a, a play I wrote called "In a World Created by a Drunken God," where it's a story of a a, a mixed blood person like me mm -hmm. living in an apartment in Toronto. There's a knock on the door. He opens it, and it's a brother he never knew he had, who is white from his father, who had disappeared before he was born. And the story progresses where the the brother had tracked him down because their father is dying of chronic renal failure and needs a kidney. And so nobody in the immediate family is acceptable. So he, the father confessed an infidelity, told the son, the son tracked, did all the stuff, tracked him down, and now wants the native boy to give a blood sample to see if he might be um, uh, able to donate a kidney. So it becomes this discussion of what are your responsibilities? De like if, if you and only you had the ability to save a life for only a, cert, uh, um, a certain amount of discomfort, wouldn't you feel obligated as opposed to being obligated to somebody you have no connection to who abandoned you? Mm -hmm. um, would, you feel, uh, would you feel you were responsible for that life? So as I said, I play, I play devil's advocate with that and I try to make it a 50-50 discussion. Do you ever have any resentment to that other side of you? No, it's, uh, I get asked that and I always say it's hard to miss or be resentful against something you never had. Mm. You know, life goes on. I I had my grandma grandfather. Um, I had a, I, one of the things I like saying is I come from both a big family and a small family. I come from a big family because my mother was the oldest of fourteen, uh, which is what happened when you didn't have the internet. <laughs> so with um, with aunts and like marriages, I had something like twenty or twenty two aunts and uncles, and I lost count at about twenty or twenty two first cousins. But at the same time, I come from a small family. It was just me and my mother. Mm -hmm. And my mother blames that on the fact that when I was born, I was 11 pounds, 13 ounces. <laughs> Breach. You're a big kid. <laughs> I like to think both quality and quantity. I've had two kids. That's a big kid. <laughs> I have two kids. I was, one girlfriend said, that's two babies. That is two, because both <laughs> my kids were five pounds. And I had a C-section. But anyway, uh, so your friend in that same conversation we are just talking about said that it's impossible for Indigenous people or for any minority group to be racist. Uh, what do you yeah. say to that? Oh, now, it's, I wrote that a long time ago, yeah. and it's like, I've, I've learned a lot since, since the whole concept that, and again, I don't know how true this is. I have a lot of friends who are academics, my partner's academic, mm -hmm. and this whole discussion that like racism is, that, is, is actually um, a social and economic thing rather than an actual racial thing. It's like, um, you know, one of the things I learned about humor is, Race, racism works from the top down, you know, the power struggle, the ladder, whereas comedy usually works from the bottom up. I can, I or people uh, of a um, lower social economic group can make fun of those higher up than us, higher up the social political the ladder. In power, I guess. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas they cannot make fun of people below them because that's racism. Mm -hmm. So, um, or, or if, if it is so-called racism, but so the the view of racism has sort of gotten really kind of interesting because the, again, as I said, it's more of an economic or a, or a socio-political thing than an actual racial thing. Um, um, but on the other hand, I do know people who just hate one race, hates another race because of that race. So it it, it is a very very murky topic. And one of the essays also touches on um, the politics of interracial dating. Well, yeah. Is that still a taboo in 2016? Not really. I mean, I'm, I'm a product of that. <laughs> uh, and, and no, not so much anymore. I mean, they still hear about stuff about... Um, I had a friend who was dating a, a native... Somebody who's half mm -hmm. dating a native woman who then... Native woman broke up with him because she wanted to have completely native children, which, uh, you know, to help uh, preserve the bloodlines, that kind of thing. Um, that 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 sometimes happens, um, uh, but I don't think it's as much an issue anymore as it once was. The interesting thing about all that whole thing is um, how what I find really interesting. Having traveled the world, right? I've been I spent some time in Australia. I spent some a lot of time in India, and 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 places like Mexico and stuff like that, where there's this big not interest. There's this big um, I guess interest in terms of Indigenous people looking, trying to look as light-skinned as possible. Mm -hmm. 
You go to India, all the big Bollywood stars are, are, are light skinned. You go to a lot of the resorts, they have whitening creams yeah. in the bathrooms that cause cancer. Right? You can go to a, you can go to um, a, um, a spa and have a whitening thing, and yet as as Canadian native people and going to these places, we're going to the beach trying to get as dark <laughs> as possible. Same in Mexico, right? Because all the big Mexican stars are usually fair skinned. Um, so I, I always found that really interesting, and and working on something. You know, I used to write for. Um, North of 16, and all my friends were native actors, and I would, I would go, they would invite me to go out to auditions. I would go to these auditions, and I would show up to audition for the role of a 16th century Mohawk warrior looking, going like this. And they're like, who? And, <laughs> you and, got, you're in the wrong place, buddy. <laughs> and so, yeah, it used to, it, it was a flip side here. In the native, in, in, in native arts, the darker you are was better, right? So I gave up wanting to be an actor and decided I, um, I'll do the writer thing. And um, so, one, one, uh, another uh, topic that you touched in the essay, you were on a radio show, at a radio show, and uh, the host said to you, why is it that Native men... Why is it all Native men, when they reach a certain, a certain level, level of, a, of, of success and affluence, always end up dating and marrying oh, white, white women? women. Yeah. Well, I mean, in the black culture, too, people have been asked that same question. Is that a valid question? Or? Well, I guess it is. You look yeah. at, yeah, I'd have to say it is a valid question. And of course, like, this is on live radio, and all of a sudden, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I am now responsible for speaking for all Native of men in Canada, and I started like hemming and hawing because I'm taking off, I'm off guard. I've got my cup of coffee here. I've just gotten off the plane, and I started doing this again, the socioeconomic thing about well, you know, there are more successful white people than native people, and more successful, um, I guess, native men than native women, and you always tend to end up dating people in your socioeconomic group. And, and I just got really, really annoyed and said, or it could be white women are just easier to find in the dark. <laughs> <laughs> and I just remember, and just sort of look at me, and then I just sort of went on and talked about. It. But one thing, but one thing you really have to learn uh -huh. is you never date a white person after Labor Day. Because <laughs> it's not in vogue. <laughs> it's just not done. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I feel bad for laughing at that joke. <laughs> but we can laugh at it because. Because we're oppressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, well, it, you also wrestle with the notion that being successful and being indige indigenous are incompatible. Is that true? Why is that? Oh, no. I, I, did I say that? Yeah, in one of the essays. Oh, again, that was 15 years ago. Yeah. <laughs> and it, well, it depends on your definition of success. Yeah. Um, you know, next, this coming um, fall, my 29th book comes out. Wow. Um, Congratulations. And I, and I have lectured in about 18, 19 countries around the world about native theater, native sexuality, native arts, um, native identity, native humor, all these different things. So I think I've reached a certain level of success. Um, I remember, okay, it's coming back to me now, because there's a whole bunch of different topics about that. There was a person who once said back in the, I think it was 70s or 80s, that um, if you have to be poor, if you have to, who is very, who had, reach a certain level of, again, success and affluence, who'd mm -hmm. said, if in order to be Indian, I have to be poor, then I don't see the point in being Indian, right? And um, I remember talking with a woman on my reserve who, who basically, when I was talking about um, um, somebody who had said, I think it was the essay where I talked about this middle-class, white, well-educated woman had had a problem with one of the jokes in my book on me funny, and I was I, I got a whole bunch of responses from educated, academically inclined Native women to combat this. And my friend basically said, you know, real Native people can't understand this, all this this weird funny talk about this issue, um, and real Native people just are you know are accustomed to working within the community, working within the land, dealing with issues, not with this all this highfalutin stuff. And I think that's what I was sort of talking about. But I think that perception has now officially um, uh, doesn't exist. I mean, you look at the success of the Inspire Awards, what used to be the Canadian Native Arts Foundation. Um, education has often been referred to as the new buffalo. It is what is going to survive, what is going to allow our people to survive into the next century. In fact, um, I think it was Murray Sinclair who said about the uh, TRC and the residential schools, he said, it was education that got us into this mess and it's education that's going to get us out of this mess. 
So I want to finish the conversation off by um, asking you whether you've noticed a growing sense of pride uh, in not only being Aboriginal, but respect for people of Aboriginal descent in Canada. Oh, I think so. I think the movement has been absolutely amazing. Look at the success of the Idol No More. Out of, out of, when I'm going to, I was going to say out of nowhere, that's inaccurate, but the sudden explosion of Aboriginal pride. I, was, I participated in a round dance at Young and Dundas here in Toronto, at various malls in Peterborough, all over the place. Seeing that kind of thing, momentary, a, a flash, uh, a flash round dance, enough to get people's attention, but not really causing that much uh, disruption, I think is absolutely brilliant and it sort of has wakened up the Canadian population to some of these issues. The other interesting thing um, that I find so progressive, um, I've been to Australia a couple times, and um, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when I was once there, I was at a, uh, an international theatre festival. And every meeting, they started up, they started each meeting by thanking the uh, Aborigine nation tribe on whose land the conference was taking place on, and I was sitting there going, wow, that's interesting, that's progressive. Good, good for you, and I remember writing an article about that, and I came back, and now it, everybody does it, mm -hmm. everywhere. I was at some function yesterday, I forget, I forget where I was yesterday, but out of having nothing to do with native issues or whatever, suddenly somebody who just got, the person running it got up and talked about, you know, first of all, I'd like to thank the Haudenosaunee, the Mississauga New Credit, on whose land, traditional land we now stand, and I just, Ten years ago, that was unheard of. Now it's what's the term, de rigueur, mm -hmm. and I just thought, now that's progress. It's fantastic. It's been such a pleasure speaking to you. Oh, you say that to so, all your guests. Well, I do, just to you. Uh, but you're going to be back tomorrow. I'm all a quiver. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit tvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.